Have you ever had a moment, you might have had it this weekend, <laughs> where you're going about your life, your daily grind, the normal, and then suddenly everything changes, <laughs> whether it's a, a storm, a physical storm, or it's something you read, something you hear in the news, or somebody you meet. Whatever it is, in a moment, everything changes and you weren't expecting it. That exact thing happens in Mark chapter two. Mark chapter two, verse one. It says, a few days later, when Jesus again entered Capernaum, the people heard that he had come home. Jesus had come home. They gathered in such large numbers that there was no room left, not even outside the door. So it was standing room only. And he preached the word to them. So some men came bringing to him a paralyzed man carried by the four of them. Since they couldn't get him to Jesus because of the crowd, they made an opening in the roof above Jesus by digging through it and lowered the mat the man was lying on. It says, when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralyzed man, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some teachers of the law, also known as the haters, right? Haters were sitting there thinking to themselves, why does this fellow talk like that? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive sins but God alone? Immediately, Jesus knew in his spirit that this is what they were thinking in their hearts. And he said to them, why are you thinking these things? Which is easier to say to this paralyzed man, your sins are forgiven, or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority, amen, on earth to forgive sins. So he said to the man, I tell you, get up, take your mat and go home. <laughs> he got up, took his mat and walked out in full view of them all. This amazed everyone and they praised God saying, we have never seen anything like this. What if this morning before you left this building, you said, I have never seen anything like this. What if in your quiet time this week, in a secret place behind closed doors where you don't even post it on Instagram, but it's just you and Jesus, and before you get your face up off the floor, you say, I have never experienced anything like that before. He can do it, amen? Would you pray with me? God, we're so thankful for your word that it's alive and active. God, would it pierce our hearts this morning? Holy Spirit, would you speak directly to us? We believe that you're alive and you're active and you're moving. So Father, would you pour out your spirit on us? In Jesus' name, and the whole house said, amen, amen. Right now, go ahead, wherever you're sitting, just grab a seat. We're just gonna jump right in this morning. And as you grab your seat, turn to the person next to you and say, I am so glad you're here. All right, now turn to the, turn to the person, turn to the person you totally just ignored right now and say, neighbor, you're my second option, but I'm glad you're here too. You're my second option, but I'm glad you're here too. All right, go ahead and grab your seats. Today's gonna to be a fun day at church. Who went in through the upper lobby and saw the craziness happen upstairs? We've got all kinds of tables for gatherings up there today. It is going to be fun. I never knew a storm to stop my God, amen? So it's gonna be a party whether it's inside or outside. There is a hay bale maze outside if you wanna get your feet soggy. It's more of like a mud pit, but you know, have at it, so. So this past week, I was looking through some playlists on Spotify. And I was going through the songs on some of these playlists. I found this one playlist that was, uh, it was retro, which some of you guys will laugh because it's songs from the early 2000s. So you're like, retro, what? Yeah. Hey, 
That's retro, okay? Just breaking the news to you. Early 2000s, all right? And there was this one song on there by Beyonce. Anybody know Beyonce? Caleb, Caleb's a huge fan of Beyonce. He listens all the time. He comes in on Monday morning like, ah, uh, you know. Oh, there's this, <laughs> yeah. There's a song on this playlist by Beyonce. And I wrote it down. I wrote down the chorus because, uh, I, I didn't know the song, but it goes like this. All right, bear with me. But the song by Beyonce, I kid you not, it, it goes like, as she says, me, myself, and I, that's all I got in the end. That's what I found out. And there ain't no need to cry. I took a vow that from now on, I'm gonna be my own best friend, right? Me, myself, and I, that's all I got in the end. I'm gonna be my own best friend. Yeah, how's that working out for you? right? How's that working out for you? I'm sitting there thinking, I hadn't heard that song. It's like 14 years old, I guess, but I'm like, that is the dumbest song I have ever heard in my life, right? And don't worry, if you are a Beyonce fan, it's okay, because we have done the same thing, this whole idea of like, it's just me and I got it on my own. We've done that whole thing. We've done it in the church, if you don't believe me, it has crept in. What's that old school church song that's like, oh man, I wish I had Alex out here still, but it's like, it's like as long as I got King Jesus, as long as I got King Jesus, as long as I got King Jesus, I don't need a body else, yeah. No, no. As long as you got King Jesus and nobody else, that's it. No wonder your life is a wreck. Right, because Jesus is good. But what happens when there's something in the world? What happens when there's a crowd? What happens when there's that thing that happens and you get stuck and you don't know where to go? You don't know who to turn to. We were not meant to do life on our own. Amen? That is a lie that I believe the devil himself tries to sell us and sometimes we buy it inside the church, outside the church, and sometimes we believe it. That I don't need anybody, I've got it on my own, I'm this independent, post-enlightenment, I'ma do it on my own, I got it. And that's the way that life's supposed to be. But what we're talking about today is the exact opposite. And I believe this is something that makes the devil nauseous. I believe that this shakes the gates of hell. Because I'm not sure that the enemy is too worried about church attendance anymore. The, the stats show that the average American church goer goes to church 1.7 times a month. So one to two times a month. And the reality is, is you can come in these doors, you can listen, you can worship, and you can walk out those doors and not introduce yourself to a single person. You can do that. You, there is a thing called playing church. That is possible, right? I'm not sure that the enemy is super worried about church attendance, but this morning we're talking about radical community. And that is something that I think really makes him nauseous. Amen? Turn to your neighbor and say radical community. Oh, come on, are we awake? Turn to your neighbor and say radical community. <laughs> oh, help me this morning. God did not create you to be alone. You cannot go against the way that God created and designed you. He wired us for connection. He hard hardwired our souls for community. And every single one of us, introvert or extrovert, we have this deep desire for belonging. We have a deep desire to be known and deeply loved. And God created humanity that way. And it's beautiful. And every single one of us, he created us, he created us that way. I need people in my life. It cannot just be me alone from the moment I was born to the day I die. It cannot just be me and King Jesus. It sounds good, but it doesn't make practical sense. And it's not what the Bible says. I need people. Isn't it strange that when God took on human flesh and he came to earth, his name 
was Jesus. I'm thinking, okay, he, he, he comes to earth and he starts this rescue mission to save the world, to turn the world upside down. I'm thinking if I'm the all-knowing, all-powerful, all-good, all-seeing God, I'm gonna do this on my own. I'm, I'm good because I'm gonna be the only one in the end that has to take the ultimate punishment on the cross, right? I think he's gonna do it on his own. He's gonna take this on a solo mission, but that's not what he does, is it? He chooses 12 guys to be with him. 12 guys, in my opinion, are slowing the mission down. Can we be honest? But God's design, God's desire is community. He chose to be in community. So Jesus, he's come to earth. He's picked out these 12 guys, interesting guys, might I add, lots of fishermen to do life with. He's moving in power. He's doing miracles. And the word is beginning to spread in the region that Jesus is in town. Mark chapter two. It says, Jesus comes to Capernaum. It says, when Jesus gets to a certain house. Now we don't, it, do, it doesn't say whose specific house that is, but most of the scholars agree that that is Peter's house. Peter's house. So he gets to Peter's house. The Bible says when he gets there, it is packed. Now we're talking standing room only, shoulder to shoulder, like fire marshals about to come in and bust it up, kind of packed, right? It is no good, but it is packed. Why? Because they heard the rumors. There's this man going around and he's got a word that's different. He's got a message that is being delivered with power and authority. So Jesus, I can just imagine, he, he gets up in the middle of this room, this packed room. I mean, there's people on the inside, on the outside. A lot of the houses didn't have doors on them. So people can just see right through, which there's no re ring doorbells, you know, on that day. But people, <laughs> I know y'all love ring doorbells now. You're like hiding from the UPS guy, but <laughs> I just leave it on the porch. No one's home. What? No. Uh, but I mean, they're looking through the door. They're just trying to catch a glimpse of Jesus in the center of the room. And he's just standing there and he gets up probably clears his throat and everybody's just like waiting to see something crazy. It's like that scene. I don't know if you've seen it. I, went, I was going to put a clip up on the screen and the Mr. Incredibles and the, the very, one of the very first scenes of Mr. Incredible in the very first movie, he gets out of his car and there's this little kid in the driveway and he goes, what are you waiting for? And the kid goes, Something amazing, I guess, right? It's like classic, but it's like, that's what these people were looking at Jesus for. They were just like waiting to see Jesus do something amazing because they heard the rumors. So he gets up in the middle of the room, packed house. Everybody's quiet. They're just waiting to see what he's gonna say. What does Jesus do? It says, he preached the word to them. And a room packed with people, Jesus's priority was to preach the word of God. Amen? That is something I'm thankful for. Don't get me wrong. Jesus is our savior. Jesus is a miracle worker, right? But he is also a preacher of the word of God. Amen? Because the word of God cuts straight to the heart. And I can just imagine the best teacher to ever walk the earth, Jesus, who, by the way, was the word made flesh, John says. So honestly, all he would have had to do is get up, stand there and just go, you know, because he is the word made flesh, but he opens up the Holy Scriptures and starts reading. And I bet everybody in that house was hanging on every single word he said you could probably hear a pen drop until they all got distracted and there were no iPads, there were no cell phones. They all got distracted though. Why? Because they heard a pitter patter on the roof. So they all start to look up. <laughs> Jesus is like, what's happening? He starts to hear it too. Before you know it, 
debris starts falling from the roof, getting in their hair and they're like, God, you know, debris starts falling. And there starts to be a little hole in the ceiling. Sunlight starts to fall through, shining on them. And the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And understand this is Peter's house, right? Let me, let me explain something to you about the disciples real quick because they got different Enneagrams. They got different personality tests. Okay, if you were gonna dig a hole in somebody's roof, you should always dig a hole in Disciple John's roof, all right? Because Disciple John, he's the one who's always laying his head on the chest of Jesus. If you, if you were like to dig a hole in his roof, he'd probably be like, oh, great. Now I can see the stars better that my creator made, you know? It just like turns everything positive and so good. But Peter, he's got some working things out still. That he's still working some things out, right? Like, I know, I know a lot of you are like Peter, like, you love Jesus, but don't let somebody cut you off on the highway, right? Because Peter has a little bit of a temper, all right? So this is Peter's house. They're digging a hole through the roof of Peter's house. I just imagine Peter, you know, debris falling down and Peter's like, what the? And Jesus is like, oh, calm down, calm down, come on. What in the world is happening? Calm down, Peter, I'll make you another roof, whatever. I'm a carpenter, I'll do the roof too, whatever. I can just imagine what's happening. And then they start lowering this man down on a mat right in front of Jesus. The man hits the floor and verse five says, when Jesus saw their faith, Jesus saw their faith. But wait a second, I thought Hebrews said, that faith is the substance of things hoped for and not seen. So how did Jesus see their faith? What that tells me is that faith is not passive, but faith is active. And when you're living in activated faith, people can tell. John Wimber said it best. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K. If that took you a second, that's not how you spell faith, right? Faith is spelled risk because when you're, <laughs> when you're living an activated faith, people can see it, right? Amen? So Jesus saw their faith, their faith, collective. It wasn't just about the paralyzed man. No, Jesus was responding to the faith of his community. That's the power of radical community because we all find ourselves stuck sometimes. We all find ourselves paralyzed by something, by fear, by doubt, by depression, by a storm. You need people who have faith for you. And this is, the, this, this is it right here, is these friends knew something. They knew that their friend needed help. And this is what community is about, knowing the needs of your friends. They knew what their friend needed. He needed healing. And they knew just the guy who could probably do it. They had faith. So they knew our friend needs a touch from Jesus. Desperately, our friend needs a touch from Jesus. And they said, I'm not going to stop until he gets there. This is community. This is community, that we would go to the ends of the earth to see to it that our friends encounter Jesus, amen? To the ends of the earth. No wall, no barrier, no crowd, no roof can stop our friend from getting to Jesus. This is a roof tearing off faith. We're gonna do whatever it takes. Why? Because they know Jesus is the one who can change everything, amen? There's something different about this group of friends. See, it's one, you probably know this. There's, it's one thing to just have some friends, but it's another thing when all your friends are gathered together, centered around the person of Jesus. It's totally, totally different, totally different type of friend group. See, these friends knew about Jesus and they had faith in what he could do. They said, a roof doesn't stop us from getting our friend to Jesus. There was something different about them. You need people who will carry you when you can't carry yourself. It happens to the best of us, it does. It's a thing called life. 
these friends believed so strongly that if they could get their friend in front of him, then his life would change. So I think my question for you this morning is, do you have somebody in your life that'll tear off a roof for you? And you think I'm talking figuratively, like, oh yeah, I got somebody that would bring me soup when I'm sick. No, I'm literally talking about, would they actually tear off a roof for you? Like if Jesus was down the road, two miles away, and for whatever reason, you couldn't get there, your car's out of, out of commission or you're paralyzed or whatever it is, do you have people that would literally put you on their back, sweat and all, and carry you to them so you can meet Jesus? I like, soup's great, but I want a community that will do that. Do you have people in your life that'll tear off a roof to get you closer to Jesus? Turn to your neighbor and say, tear off the roof. Tear off the roof, tear off the roof. All right, let's get back into the story. Because what's crazy is what happens next. So this man's laying on the ground right in front of Jesus. Peter's back there like ticked off, right? He's done for. He's like, my roof, my roof, my roof, right? He looks at the man who's now laying on the ground right in front of him. His community of friends, they're like peering through the hole like, did it work? It's like, I told you that rope was strong enough. You know, did it work, did it work? We got him there. You know, they're like looking, waiting and everybody's just dumbfounded and confused, including the teachers of the law in the back of the room with their papyrus, like ready to take notes. Like, what's he gonna say out of context? Like ready to, ready to get him. And no matter who was in the room, their social economic status, whatever it is, everyone is expecting Jesus to heal this man and then move along with whatever else he was saying. Jesus looks to the guy, probably turns his attention off angry Peter for a minute, looks back to the guy and he says, son, your sins are forgiven. I wish I could have seen the look on that guy's face. Okay. Maybe I'm like Peter. Maybe I'm still working some things out, but I'm not gonna lie. If I'm the guy sitting in front of Jesus waiting to be healed and Jesus goes, hey, your sins are forgiven. I'm going, oh, appreciate it, Jesus. Yeah, like that's what I came all the way down here for is so my sins are forgiven. Like, all right, boys, hoist me back up. My legs don't work, but my sins are forgiven. I'm good to go. Like, carry me back. Like, that's not what he came for. What are you talking about, Jesus? What does he mean? Put ourselves in the story. What happens when Jesus addresses something that you don't want him to address? Or what happens when it feels like Jesus is overlooking something that you think is so obvious? God, if you would just fix this one thing, I'll be good, I'll be good. But how many of you know that Jesus likes to cut deeper? This man wanted his legs to be healed, but Jesus says, I'm gonna heal everything. I'm gonna heal your legs, but I'm also going to heal your soul because what good is it for you to have good legs and a broken soul? Jesus goes deeper over and over and over. When we find ourselves in community, we find that Jesus gives us more than what we came for. The friend thought he was gonna get his legs healed, but Jesus chooses to heal everything. You might join a small group community here that we call gatherings. You might join it to get your, maybe to fix your loneliness, but what you get instead is a group of friends that will truly fight for you. You might join a, a gathering to start reading your Bible more, learn more about the Bible, but what you get is friends that will see to it that you have a true encounter with God himself. You might join a gathering so that somebody else cooks for you on Friday or just for something else to do, right? But what you get is some fresh breath breathed back into your lungs, the very breath of God, something that you haven't experienced in a while. It's more than what you came for. Let's continue in the story. <laughs> so Jesus looks at the crowd and he knows the teachers of the law, the haters, he knows what they're thinking. Like, who is this guy? Only God can heal heal sins, right? Jesus says to them, which is easier to say that your sins are forgiven or to say, get up, take your mat and walk. But I want you to know that the son of man has authority on earth to forgive sins. 
I used to read this story and think, okay, which is easier? Because like, he doesn't actually give you the answer, <laughs> but like, which is easier? I used to think that it would be to say your sins are forgiven because the reality is, is who's gonna check? Like the guy's gonna die and you're not really gonna know. It's like, your sins are forgiven, your sins are forgiven. Like Oprah style, you could just say it. Nobody's gonna check. Nobody's gonna actually know. It's like, what's actually the harder thing to do is to say, get up and walk because what if he doesn't, <laughs> right? But Hebrews tells us something very different. Hebrews says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. Jesus knew that forgiving this man of his sins, healing his broken soul, would take the cross. It would take his commitment to the cross and to shed his blood. And he was fine with that commitment but he knew that he had to die to heal the man's soul. And that one is harder than saying, get up and walk. But he knew that he could make that promise because the grave wouldn't hold him for very long. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Amen. What this man didn't know, still laying there. <laughs> Everybody got debris in their hair. He's kind of like confused, your sins are forgiven. What he didn't know is Jesus did the miracle as soon as he said it. It was a two for one, I guess. He did more than what he came for. <laughs> he turns his attention back to the paralyzed man and he says, I tell you, get up, pick up your mat and go home. <laughs> the man looks at Jesus like, did he really just do what I think he did? The, the friends are still like, what's happening in, in there? You know, he starts to wiggle his toes. His knees start to crackle and he starts to feel everything again. And the man gets up, picks up his mat, says he walked out the door. Says he gets up, takes his mat and walks out of the house, shoving people through the crowd probably in full view of them all. Jesus sends him back home this time walking alongside his friends, not carried by his community, not being carried, but instead fully restored. The mess that the man found himself in, Jesus turned it into a message and said, go back and tell everybody about it, amen. Jesus will do the same for you. He'll turn your mess into a message, amen. So here it is. Before Jesus, this man was paralyzed. He was paralyzed physically and he was paralyzed spiritually. And because of his community, he encounters Jesus. Not only is he healed, but he's also sent back to his community, carrying the very thing that carried him. Jesus goes deeper. And with community, he does more than what you came for. This isn't just a story about one man on a mat and his, his healing. This is the story of the faith of an entire community of four friends that knew that their friend needed Jesus. It's a story of a people that believed that Jesus really could do the unthinkable, the impossible. It was a community so committed to each other that they rather tear the roof off of Peter's house than let their friend suffer. You need the right people around you. You need a community that will carry you when you can't carry yourself. You need a people around you that will tear off the roof to get you to Jesus. And this type of community will get you there. And when you get there and there's somebody else around you that's dealing with the same thing, Jesus calls you to then be that friend. Amen? Talking about the lies that we believe, I believe that living in community is an act of resistance against the devil's schemes. I really do when the devil tries to keep you isolated and depressed, selling you the lie that you can do this all on your own and so it's all gonna be okay. And then finally you get stuck. I believe joining a community is really what shakes the gates of hell. It's gonna cripple him to his knees. I promise you, if you stick around long enough, you will experience that there's more than what you come for. Might take a couple of times, but you'll experience it. I did. Because this is exactly what happens in, in Acts chapter two with the early church. We need people in our life. 
I'm not in the game of superficial church or superficial friendships or superficial community. And sometimes it is hard, like they were saying. It's never perfect. I was talking to somebody the other day and they were like, oh, I'm just waiting to find the perfect community. And I'm thinking in the back of my head, like, well, when you find it, don't join it because you're gonna mess it up. <laughs> like, and don't invite me because you already know I'm gonna mess it up. Like, community is never perfect because it's full of imperfect people. But it is more than worth it. I can promise you. What we see in Acts chapter two is this picture of the early church. We'll finish up with this. The very first Jesus-centered communities established by the man himself. It says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. So they loved the word. They devoted themselves to fellowship. They loved each other. To the breaking of bread, they loved food, good food and to prayer. They loved interceding for one another. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. So that's like the larger worship setting like we do here on Sundays. And then they ate together with glad and sincere hearts broke bread in their homes. That's the smaller gatherings in homes that we're talking about. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily, those who were being saved. My point in reading that is that this is not a new idea. This is not just trying to get you plugged into another church program. This is what Jesus set up for his church. Both the large gathering of believers for worship and teaching and all of those things and the small life on life gatherings for journeying through all aspects of life together, all centered around Jesus. Community isn't just a good idea when you have time. It is the biblical standard for followers of Jesus and what God can do through your life in community is far better than you could have ever imagined. You'll see Jesus more clearly. You'll understand the Father more accurately and the Holy Spirit will light a fire in your heart that you didn't think was possible. This is the Christian life. This is the walk that we're called to. It's radical from what the world tries to sell you but hand in hand with others through the good, the bad, the ugly, everything in between. That's what it's about. Amen? Where'd you stand? Jesus, thank you that you are our savior. Thank you for taking the cross, shedding your blood for the forgiveness of sins once and for all. God, thanks that you like to do the deep work before you just work on the outside stuff. God, sometimes we don't even know what our own problem is on the deeper issues, but you do. And those are the things that you work on. God, thank you that you work in us and you work in us through community. Jesus, thank you for setting up a model for your church so we don't have to reinvent or invent something new, but we can just follow in your footsteps your holy, beautiful footsteps. Jesus, thank you for the church. We're not perfect, but thank you for calling us your bride anyway. God, would you fill our gatherings full of authentic and real people who are craving an encounter with you? Would you get us plugged in, put it on our hearts to jump in God, thank you that you're still healing. You're still working miracles. And thank you for your word. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, amen.